Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Dorothy Marsick on May 3, 2022. Dorothy is a professor at Columbia University, author and playwright, who was a former professor at Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management. She was a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Economics in Prague. She served as advisor to the U.S. Ambassador of the Czech Republic and was a delegate of both the United Nations Economic and Social Development Summit in Copenhagen and the UN Commission on the Status of Women. She's the author of 15 books. We talk about three of her books in the interview. From one of them, she created a musical production that had 3,200 performances in over 70 cities. I started the interview by asking Dorothy where she grew up and what was religious life like growing up. I grew up in Pewaukee, Wisconsin, which is 17 miles west of Milwaukee. Very small town, 2,000 people lived there when I was a kid. My mother had grown up as a Lutheran, and she married a Catholic, but my father didn't go to church, so she started taking us to Lutheran church, but then she quit going. So I found myself around seven eight years old, going to church by myself. I would walk to church sometimes, it was a couple miles, or sometimes neighbors would take me or the minister would come and pick me up. And I have no idea why I was so motivated to go to church by myself at that age. The minister, Pastor Anderson, took me under his wing because I would go to the church picnics and so on, and there was no family there. So I would sit with his family. I got to know him and his children who were roughly my age. I was very active in Luther League. And I grew up in, a, let's say, a dysfunctional household that had violence and alcoholism. So church was a haven for me. And there was a sense of order and purpose and People were kind and generous with one another. So that might have had something to do with it. My mother remarried a Catholic when I was 10. And she the only reason she was able to do that, because Catholics don't believe in divorce. My mother was divorced from the wife beater. Hmm. But the priest said, well, because my father was Catholic and my mother was Lutheran and they got married by a justice of the peace, it wasn't a real marriage, which meant that it was preferable for my mother to have lived in sin for 18 years and have four illegitimate children than it was for her to get divorced. But anyway, so she married my stepfather, who was a much nicer man. He wanted me to go to church with them because my mother became Catholic, but I was like this gung-ho Lutheran. You know, nobody was going to make me change. So I, I finished high school being in the Luther League and going to Lutheran conferences for youth and having leadership positions. And my family was poor, so we didn't have really money to send me to college. I was very smart, but I you know, never knew how I was going to really get through college. My minister found a college in Minnesota, a Lutheran college, that was going to give me a complete ride, scholarship, room and board, and everything, which was like right now somebody giving me $5 million. My mother wouldn't let me go because she said it was too far away because it was like about a five-hour drive. So I went to Madison, Wisconsin, which was an hour drive. In Madison, well, there were people all over the world and all kinds of socioeconomic levels and every color that human beings exist. And I got involved in all of the protests and, and so on. And that's where I found the Baha'i faith after I'd been searching for a while for something that made sense to me. I really have to thank my mother for not letting me go to the Lutheran college. 
Because I wonder what my life would have been like if I would have gone with all these white 18-year-olds who were all Lutherans. How my mind would have developed compared to going to Madison where where there was all this diversity and intellectual ferment and ideas and people also searching like I was. I don't imagine in a Lutheran college there would be people really searching for a new religion or searching for God. But that's what I was doing because once I got to Madison, I realized that Lutheranism wasn't really answering the questions that I had about life and the universe and humanity. And I came across the Baha'i Faith at a booth that was the Baha'i Club had set up took me about a year of study to realize that this is what I'd been looking for for several years. And it changed my life, becoming a Baha'i. As I said, I had grown up in a lot of violence. Having the faith gave me a real sense of stability and structure in my life and support, a way that I'd sort of had when I was a Lutheran, but this became even more because I was an adult and I understood more. It was really good for me from the beginning. Dorothy, your college career began by studying radio, TV, and film, and then your master's was focused on educational media, and then another master's in public health and a doctorate in organizational behavior. Can you describe for us your thinking and perspective as you transition through these various fields in your academic work? Well, I started out in college majoring in theater. I wanted to be an actor. I took some fabulous theater courses and was in some productions. And then I became a Baha'i. The person who taught me the faith was very adamant that the faith did not need people in theater or actors and I should study education or something that was useful to the world. So I dropped out of theater, I switched majors and went into education. But I found the coursework so simple and unchallenging, I decided to go back into liberal arts. And I ran into one of my colleagues the next semester, one of my co-students, and she said, I haven't seen you in class, Dorothy, where are you? I said, well, I switched majors. She said, why? This is the easiest major on campus. And I thought, oh, one day you're going to be teaching my kids. So I really struggled with what to do. I majored in dance for a while. Then I was a physics major. I was really into astrophysics. And then I went to the Baha'i National Center. I went to the House of Worship on a tour. And I asked to see Natalie De Bono, who was the head of public information for the National Center, the Baha'i National Center, which is in Wilmette, Illinois. I asked her for advice, and she said, you know, we really need Baha'is who are in the media because it's going to become more and more important. So I went back to Madison, and I switched majors to radio, TV, film, which turned out to be good because it was in the same department as theater. So I didn't lose any more credits. I'd lost a whole semester's worth of credits by going into education. And I loved it. I loved studying film and television. And, you know, we had to actually do TV programs. And everybody knew that I was a Baha'i and knew about the ideas of world unity and virtues and the values that Baha'is had. And one of my professors used to say every time he saw me he'd go hi (laughs) Baha'i and then I graduated and I didn't know what to do I I went on a a Baha'i youth program in Mexico and I thought oh maybe I'll get a job in television in Mexico well I mean who in Mexico is going to hire an American girl with a bachelor's degree in radio tv film who only speaks broken Spanish I got admitted to graduate school to University of Massachusetts where a lot of Baha'is were going. And the reason I even went to graduate school is because I went to a Baha'i youth conference and one of the members of the Universal House of Justice, which is the international governing body of the Baha'i faith, and it's located in Haifa, Israel, Bor Kavlin gave a talk at this youth conference and he said, 
I advise all of you to get more education than you've ever considered because it will make you more valuable to the world. You can serve humanity better. Well, I was a senior in college, and for me to even be finishing college was more than I ever thought because my father had finished eighth grade and my mother didn't graduate from high school. So, I mean, going to college and graduating was a big deal. I never even considered graduate school, but Bohr Kaplan really inspired me. So I applied to graduate school and it was very difficult to get in to the University of Massachusetts at the time. It was Dwight Allen who was the dean and also a Baha'i. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was on television. He was doing all this innovative stuff and education. And everybody wanted to go there. They were admitting less than one out of 10. My last semester in college, I worked my way into an internship in a cable TV station in Janesville, Wisconsin, and had two weekly TV programs, and I sent him videotapes from that and newspaper articles about it and so on. So I got admitted to graduate school, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I just, I was taking classes, and I would think aimless is a pretty good word. (laughs) At the time, wanted to study children's television programming. I just wasn't sure how to go about it. So one of my professors was named Nat Rutstein, who was also a Baha'i. He had worked on NBC News for years, then was a professor at University of Massachusetts. He took me along to a conference at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, on children's television programming. It was so amazing. I mean, there were people there who were the producers and writers and directors of the top TV programs back then. One of the people who spoke was Fred Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. He stood out from all the others. Everyone else seemed to me just like, well, let's do kids programming and then we'll make it to real TV. But Fred Rogers was on a panel and he lit up the room because he was really devoted to children. But what really touched me was I was out in the hallway when Fred Rogers came out of the lecture room. There was a mother with her four-year-old son waiting. They'd been waiting for quite a while for Fred Rogers to come out. So Fred came. He saw this little boy, and the mother told him her son wanted to meet him. So Fred Rogers got down on his knees and talked to this boy as if he were the president of Gambia. He was the most important person in the world, and I thought, this guy is for real. So I decided I wanted to learn more about it, and I wanted to get an internship at some children's television show to see if that was what I really wanted to do. So I got in my car and I drove to New York. I'd arranged to meet with the people at Sesame Street. They took me out to this French restaurant and expensive food and they drank wine. I didn't because Baha'is don't drink alcohol. And it was lovely. They gave me a tour of the office. They offered me an internship. And then I got back in my car and I drove to Pittsburgh, where Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was filmed. They showed me around the studio. They took me to the vending machine. (laughs) And I fell in love with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, so I did my internship there. I tried to um, get some more full-time work in in TV there, but it wasn't really working out for me. I kept doing the internship. I got involved with the Baha'i community there, which was wonderful. And I lived near the university, and every day I'd walk past this big building that was the Graduate School of Public Health. I thought, you know, that place looks really interesting. I think I'll apply to school there. (laughs) Now, Mind you, I was finishing up my doctorate, or I was in the middle of my doctorate at University of Massachusetts and was doing things from a distance. But I thought, I like this building. It has some good feeling about it. 
I applied, I got accepted, which I thought wasn't a big deal until I asked several of my friends, mentioned it to them, and they applied. They didn't get accepted. So my idea was, I'm going to get my doctorate in public health and then just take the master's from UMass and leave there. But by the time I got admitted to the public health school, I thought, you know what, I might as well finish my doctorate and just do the master's in public health. Now, mind you, I did not know what public health was. I was in that program two years. The first year, I was so clueless. There was one course I had, I don't think I said one sentence the whole semester because I did not know what they were talking about. It was about healthcare policy. I honestly, if they would have been speaking Greek, I would have understood just as much. But I hung in there and I loved things like epidemiology and biostatistics and all of these courses. And by the end of my two years, I was just in love with this public health. And by that time, I decided to get it in organizational behavior because I, as part of my master's in public health, I took some classes in the business school and one of them was organizational behavior. And I thought, wow, this is what I want to do. So I wanted to teach organizational behavior in health administration, which is what I did. I got a job at Arizona State University teaching organizational behavior and epidemiology and health policy, something that I previously hadn't known what it was. But then I discovered after being there four years that I didn't really enjoy all of the changes in healthcare. I, I subscribe to the Federal Register, which is free to any citizen of the US. And if anybody's interested in federal legislation, you should definitely subscribe to the Federal Register. But it's like the Sorcerer's Apprentice. My office was filled with these booklets because every single thing that goes into the record, you know, sometimes a Congress will get up and say something and they'll say, oh, he only did that because he wants it to get into the Federal Register. Well, you can subscribe to that in every piece of legislation, but it's onerous. And I discovered I didn't like that part of it. So I went into generic management, just teaching organizational behavior for all organizations, healthcare or otherwise, and ended up the rest of my career in academia doing straight organizational behavior. I've written textbooks on it and given lots of workshops and keynote addresses and so on. I loved it. I loved doing the teaching. It was about understanding people. How do you create an organization where you've got workers who are satisfied, you treat them with respect and you have high productivity. And it was the people side of organizations. I did about 2000 workshops and keynote presentations in my career, which I absolutely love doing. But, you know, after a while, the travel got tiring. I mean, I've got about 5 million miles on me. And I have friends who've said to me, I want your life. I want to travel <laughs> like that. And I'll say, you know what? The first million miles was really fun. <laughs> and after that, it gets kind of old. So I've pretty much given up that kind of travel. I was teaching at Vanderbilt University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. And I was always interested in women. In the Baha'i faith, one of the principles is the quality of men and women. That was one that gave me a lot of energy and excitement. So in Nashville, I decided to do some research on how women were depicted in popular music. It started out because I was asked to do a presentation at a Baha'i conference on social and economic development on equality of men and women. And I'd been experimenting using music in my management programs up to that point and had been very successful using popular songs to help people understand management principles. So I said, you know, I'm going to go and do some research on top 40 music to see if it proves the development of the principle of Baha'u'llah, who is the founder of the Baha'i faith, that women would become more and more equal with men, that it was a movement that no soul can retard. 
what I discovered in the research going back to 1900, which is when popular music began, how women were depicted went from codependent to independent, from someone to watch over me to I will survive an independent woman. And it really was proving the emerging equality of women and men. Interestingly, nobody had ever done this research before. It might be the only time in my life I was the first time to do something. And it just took off. I started doing these presentations all over the U.S. and Australia and England and Switzerland. And I even did one in Israel and Technion University. And people just went crazy over it. And then uh, somebody said, you have to turn this into a theatrical production. I thought, what do I know about theater? But I, I got some young Baha'i women who knew music and knew musical theater. We developed the script. We debuted it in Nashville at this little 99-seat theater. I reserved the theater for two performances, and the, the cast members were like, you shouldn't have done that, Dorothy. We're never going to sell enough tickets. But it took off. We were oversold. People were calling their friends and in intermission going, you have to come and see this show. This is all about, you know, women, how we're getting our empowerment and everything. So I started doing gigs with the show around Nashville. We had some out of town gigs. When I'd started doing that as lectures, I always thought it would be sort of a one woman thing. I'd be doing corporate conferences and so on. I really never considered theater. But once it got into theater, it got more traction, and I kept waiting for the show to be discovered because I saw how electrified the audience would be. And finally, I realized no producer, no theatrical producer is going to come to Nashville because only music producers come here. So I took the show down to South Florida, rented a theater for four days, did six performances, and invited every artistic director in Southern Florida and had bought some TV spots and ads and so on. And out of that, I got two commercial producers who wanted to take this show, which is now called Respect, on. And I went with one of them. That was in 2004. And it's pretty much played somewhere all the time since then. It's played in about 95 cities. Over half a million people have seen it. Based on that, I had these two African-American women in the cast come to me and say, would you please write something like this for us? Because we don't think songs like I Will Follow Him and Que Sera Sera really speak to us as black women. So I started to work on it, but I kept thinking, I'm a white girl. What do I know? And I'd put it aside, but then I'd come back to it. And what I finally came to was that I know how to use music to tell a story. It took me like, six or seven years to get up the courage to do it and to work on it and it put it in a festival in New York in 2011 it's called Sistas the musical we just sold every ticket and a Broadway producer came to see it and he wanted to move it off Broadway where it played for nine years before COVID and it's just reopened now off Broadway so I'm speaking with Dorothy Marsick a professor at Columbia University, a playwright, and a former professor at Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management with over 20 years full-time in academia. And she talked about her book and her musical called Respect, about the equality of men and women, and then also about her musical called Sistas, which was of a similar vein, addressing the people of color. Now, you've written some books, in addition to Respect, that I was interested in one of them. You wrote a book called Managing with the Wisdom of Love, which is an interesting concept. Can you describe this for us? Yes. This was such a labor of love for me to write this book. I was living in Prague, the Czech Republic, not long after communism had left. I was a Fulbright scholar at the University of Economics in Prague and the Czech Management Center where I taught MBA students who were working full-time, but we had a weekend program. Around that time, 
there was a lot of talk about this new management paradigm, and I was really excited about it because it was all the things I'd been teaching my whole life about treating people with respect and dignity and having uh, less hierarchy, less punitive management policies, more inclusion. As I was teaching this, I started to realize, in fact, I think it was when I was teaching the MBA students over in Prague that it struck me that this new management paradigm was very much aligned with Baha'i principles of trustworthiness, shared vision, unity, respect, and treating people decently and honoring love, love of other people and and treating other people as human beings, not just pieces on the factory floor. I was asked to give a talk at the European Baha'i Business Forum, and I decided to talk about how this new management paradigm was very similar to not only Baha'i teachings, but if you go and look at the teachings of all the religions in the world, every religion tells people to be truthful and honest. I'm not saying people do that, but if you go to the holy books, that's what they say. They all speak of some kind of justice, things like forgiveness and gratitude, unity. What it said to me was that management was was applying these age-old principles that went back thousands of years from religion and was finding that, hey, this actually makes for good organizations. I was started to write an article. I was going to publish in a management journal. But then I was getting so much material there, I just wasn't sure what to do with it. But I didn't have time to work on it. I was busy teaching full-time at the Czech Management Center. I was doing a lot of things with the Baha'i community in Prague, and I had three children. I was a single mother over in Eastern Europe. And then I went skiing in Austria. I had some really close friends who had become Baha'is because I taught them the faith years before, and they were living in Austria. So I took my kids down there, and we went skiing, and I got in a ski accident. I tore two ligaments, it was very painful. I mean, they hauled me off to this hospital, you know, in an ambulance. I spoke some German so I could understand what the doctor was saying to me and he spoke some English. So between my broken German and his broken English, I learned that I had to have an operation and I'm screaming at him. I mean, it was very unkind, but because I was in a lot of pain, no, I'm too busy. I can't take time off of all this. The world sometimes makes you slow down. So I was there in the Austrian Alps. They kept me in the hospital for two weeks, which they'd never do that in the States. I had this big window out of my hospital room looking out over the Austrian Alps and watching everybody ski. Luckily, my friends Heidi and Frankie took care of my kids and took them skiing every day for those two weeks. And then I had to go back to Prague. I had a cast from my hips down to my toes, which is something they did not do in the States back then. They don't do it now. What I discovered is that Prague is not a city for handicapped people. All stairs, very few elevators or escalators. They did have some elevators that were these things that just constantly went in a loop and you'd have to jump on and jump off. Well, it's not for somebody with a cast. But most of the buildings I went into didn't even have that. So I stayed home for six weeks and they took the cast off and then I mean I couldn't even walk for a while because my leg had been atrophied so there I found myself with all this time and I started working on this paper which became a book and there's a quotation in the Baha'i writings that says my calamity is my providence that outwardly it seems terrible but inwardly it's a blessing and I thought this is it this is my calamity is my providence because if if I wouldn't have been in that ski accident I would probably still be going you know I gotta work on that book I started working on it I got an outline ideas and I had been going to management professor conferences for years and I had met this one editor for Josie Bass I didn't 
met him as a stretch. I mean, I knew his name to say hello, and I think he might have remembered my name. So I called him up from Prague, which back then was very difficult because they didn't have a very good phone system, and sometimes it'd take 20 minutes of dialing just to get a, an international line. So I got him on the phone and told him about this, and he was interested. He said, send me a proposal, which I did, and they accepted it. So another one of those things, how many times you try things and you're knocking yourself your head all over the place and jumping up and down and nothing happens this door opened right away from the beginning i intended to have quotations from all the major religions in fact i ended up doing a spreadsheet so that i had more or less equal number of quotations i sent the first draft of the book off they in turn sent it out to five reviewers who weren't Baha'is. I had also sent it to the Baha'i National Center just to make sure I was using the Baha'i quotations correctly. I was really worried that they were going to come back and be critical that I had all these Baha'i quotations in a management book. You know, this was for practicing managers. Well, they came back with a lot of comments, but nothing about the Baha'i quotations. They were fine with that. I ended up going through a number of rewrites, and the book came out in 97, was nominated as one of the top 10 business books of that year. And I did lots of presentations about it. I named them the new management virtues, which was something that was, I felt growing in organizations then. It started to decline around 2000. I think it was after the Glass-Steagall went into effect and other things that happened, but up until 2000, there was a growing number of organizations that were moving towards this model. And that was trustworthiness, which included transparency, unity, which in organizations would mean creating a shared vision, respect and dignity, treating people decently and with care, justice, so that you had not wild wage differentials like we have now where you've got people not earning a living wage and CEOs earning $500 million a year. That's pretty extreme. And just an equity in the way people are treated. And then service and humility. And there, there's been a lot of research about servant leadership and also about how service makes people happier. And, and in the Baha'i faith, service is considered one of the highest stations you can attain. And so it works in organizations and in your personal life, too, that service becomes a means of creating more satisfaction in your life. And so the book did really well. It had a lot of touching moments. I got emails from people all over the world who got it. One really special time was when I was at the Academy of Management, which is a conference for 10,000 management professors around the world. And a Saudi man in his Saudi clothes came up to me at a reception. He sought me out and he said, thank you so much for writing this book. Other people have written books Westerners have written about spirituality and management, but they mostly write about Hinduism, Christianity, and Buddhism. He said, you are the only one who quotes the holy prophet Muhammad, and I thank you so much for that. I'm speaking with Dorothy Marsick, a professor at Columbia University, a playwright, and a former professor at Vanderbilt University's Owen Graduate School of Management, with over 20 years full-time in academia. And Dorothy was just talking about her book that she wrote called Managing with the Wisdom of Love. Dorothy, another book I wanted to hear about was a book you wrote called Love Lift Me Higher. Yes, I loved writing this book. And the inspiration for it was when I was teaching organizational behavior, I got very interested in the whole new field of positive psychology. During the late 80s, psychology started shifting away from primarily a field of studying people with problems. When I was in college, Psych 101 was abnormal psychology. And shifting into the psychology of a happy, fulfilled life. 
there was a lot of research going on in organizations about how to create positive environments using these principles of positive psychology. And I saw a documentary. They talked about a study that had been done that showed if you read quotations from holy writings and other positive meditations or readings for 15 minutes a day, within two weeks, you would have a happier attitude. You would feel more satisfied in life. So I thought, wow, that's it? 15 (laughs) minutes a day for two weeks? So I decided I was going to write a book that would help people do that. Because so much of my career had been around pedagogy and developing workshops. I'm very much into experiential learning. I wrote a book that looked at different qualities of love and happiness, had quotations, again, from different religions. This one was more on Baha'i quotations, but I did have quite a few from the other religions and exercises. So there'd be some text as an introduction, there'd be quotations, there'd be exercises for people to fill out and understand themselves better and how to make their life better. And then at the end of each chapter, I'd have a case study of somebody who had been struggling but found answers through one of the principles that was in the book. For example, you know, I had chapters on love and forgiveness, appreciating versus judging, love and families, knowing and loving yourself, and love, humility, and gratitude, and things like that. And the book did well, and I did a lot of talks on it, and people did study groups on it, and I'm very proud of what it is and what it represents. Dorothy, I understand you have a podcast. Can you tell me about that? Yes. So, When I was a child growing up in this violent home, I had some aunts and uncles who lived more stable lives. And an uncle I was particularly close to was my uncle Vern, who lived in Beloit, Wisconsin, over an hour from Pewaukee. When I went to college in Madison, he was living just outside of Madison in Oregon, Wisconsin. And he got murdered while I was there. In fact, just about a week after I became a Baha'i, I was supposed to be at a Baha'i conference in Milwaukee that weekend, and I decided not to go for some reason, which was good, because my uncle was a big shot in Wisconsin state government, and it would have been all over the radio and TV, and that's how I would have learned about it. So my uncle had been married to a June Cleaver, the kind of woman like Tammy from Friday Night Lights, and then he had a tour to fear with somebody like Sharon Stone from Basic Instinct, Mm -hmm. left his wife, married this woman who had been married three times before, so he was husband number four. In fact, they were both married when they started this affair. Seven years later, half his head was blown off with one gunshot wound and the brain splattered over his bedroom wallpaper. His second wife confessed, but there was always some question about, did she really do it? Her son, my uncle's stepson, was in the house, and Suzanne, the woman, was, by her own admission, had never lifted a gun before, and she got all my uncle's assets, including his life insurance, and got double indemnity on the life insurance. And it just, there was so much injustice there. And then, and 2014, my cousin Shannon, who had been the daughter from the first marriage, she and I had been talking for years. Whatever happened to Suzanne and her three kids? And, you know, this is before the Internet and then the Internet's that are coming. And she called me one day and she found them. She found through because one of the Suzanne's kids had killed himself and she found his grave. And, you know, so I called them. They were living in rural Tennessee, and I was living in Nashville at the time. So I called. I I wanted to go there, and I thought I'd just walk in there and and say, hey, who murdered my uncle? Was Mm -hmm. it David or was it Suzanne? And, of course, you know, that was so naive. I drove five hours through the Smoky Mountains and got there, and they were very nice to me. You know, I 
nosy cousin showing up, not cousin by marriage after 40 years. And then I started doing research, the police reports, the court records, and interviewing anybody who was still alive. I ended up writing a book called With One Shot, which was about truth and justice. There's a quotation in the Baha'i writings that says, there's nothing more important in the world of humanity than the search for truth. And that's what I was doing. I was searching for truth and justice. And so I felt like I was on a mission, which I was. And then we turned it into a podcast, which aired about a year ago from when I'm talking to you. hit number one on Apple Podcasts in the first week. And now we're up to 2.7 million downloads of the podcast. So it really touched a nerve. But I have to say through doing that it gave me closure and my cousin Shannon it helped both of us to heal from wounds that had been there for decades I got some questions answered we found out really who did murder my uncle it didn't bring my uncle back I would have traded all of it to even have one day with him but the search for truth is a really worthy goal and I spent four years working on the book and a year and a half on the podcast but it was time well spent I've always had this goal of wanting to do things that made a difference in the world Mm -hmm. in whatever way being a Baha'i helped me to find ways to do that I've worked with people on social justice projects. I've been a delegate to the Commission on the Status of Women at the United Nations for 12 years. I've Mm. done projects in Australia and different Europe and South Africa. And it's because I'm a Baha'i and I have this network of people who also are committed to making the world a better place Mm. and welcoming to anyone else with the same goal and the same vision. So it's given so much to me. I'm very grateful that I found the Baha'i Faith. Dorothy, I want to thank you so much for taking this time to share your work. Thank you. Warren, it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Dorothy Marsick, professor at Columbia University, author and playwright. You can find her work at drdorothy.com. That's DR for Dr. Dorothy.com. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website of Bahaiperspective.com and on the YouTube channel A Baha'i Perspective. You can find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i Faith, you can go to the website Baha'i.org or you can call the number one eight hundred two two Unite. I hope you'll join me next time on a Baha'i Perspective. Thoughts must be lofty, your heart is luminous, your mind spiritual, that your souls may become a dawning place for the sun of reality. Let your hearts be like unto two pure mirrors. Reflecting the stars of the heaven, love and beauty. Be like two sweet singing birds, perched upon the highest branches of the tree of life. In the air with songs of love and rapture.
like two sweet singing birds Perched upon the highest branches of the tree of life Filling the air with songs of love and rapture
I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary Yeah, I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Yeah, this desert heat struggles and the to bury me Immensity the feet we face may deter the weak His words are deep, never bleak to those that seek The chosen me who rose relentlessly to herd the sheep This bird is freed of its cage and earthly bondage Urgently needs to serve, pay worthy homage Rise to the task, eyes fixed on the knowledge Ten thousand angels got my back as promised yeah, I have the light that you're dying for I am the strength in the lion's roar I'm not much different than you Cause I got limits too But love of my creator has defined my core And that's the point where I pivot at So any strength that I'm giving, I can give it back Living at times where the world isn't filled with that Spiritual vibe, I'm in the field trying to deal with that Singing that, I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual revolutionary I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual revolutionary I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary Yeah, I am the change that I want to see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary hey. Start the revolution, spiritual in nature Fueled by the fire of our love for the maker People say the youth are the future's creators While the future is now, there is no time for later But we're lost in a world full of talk Everybody's ears are always clouded by this dross We're living in disunity, it leaves us at a loss I feel like we keep our souls in a box But now our mission is given, we've got the drive, let's be driven You see our spiritual lyrics are paired with intricate rhythms We'll make a world we envision, invent a new way of living Through revolution of the spirit, we accomplish his bidding So let me tell you the things that you're prepared to know There's gems of inestimable value that you carry though Our spirit, no need to keep it buried So say it with me, I'ma be a revolutionary, yo I am the change that I wanna see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary, yo I am the change that I wanna see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary, I am the change that I wanna see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary, yo I am the change that I wanna see Cause I'm a spiritual what? Revolutionary, When the heroes are named, let them mention she With the strength indeed to swim against the stream Let them mention he who lives intentionally Whose will will bear if the end is seen Let them mention me, let, let them mention we Who give 100%, 100 body, soul, and mentally Let them mention we who serve them then the knee And pray the blessings of the most fall generously We who rise and fight to see the justice stands With the voice to answer those who cry out What's the plan? And keep us the faith uh -huh. Then guidance to lead us to battle erase right. The problems and questions and just that we face We, we slowly, slowly transform in this unholy place. place The kingdom we build in will bring them so waste We build in dominion, so, so take, take your place singing I am the change that I wanna see Cause I am a spiritual revolutionary I am the change 